all the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to minister to us. Lord, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for your amazing grace. I pray today, Father, you'd put grace on my lips, and I pray that you put grace on our ears, put grace on our hearts, Lord, to receive from you. We ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen. If Jesus is the head of the church, then I wonder why is Christendom so fragmented? Why are there so many different groups? Why are there so many sharp disagreements over doctrine and do's and don'ts? Do you know one study from Gordon Conwell identified over 41,000 different Christian denominations in the world? So much for one body, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. With so many different kinds of churches, how do we know which one is right? Maybe they're all right. Maybe none of them are right. The other day, Maddie and I were working on a jigsaw puzzle together. That's my 10-year-old daughter. And even though it wasn't a particularly large puzzle, it was taking us quite a bit of time. It was one of those two-sided puzzles with a different picture on both sides. And so we had to decide which picture we were going to recreate. Both of the pictures were beautiful, but we opted for the picture on the front of the box. After all, that was the picture that made us buy the puzzle in the first place. So we stood the box top up in front of us, and as we kept looking at that picture, we began to piece together the exact replica of the image on the box. We forgot all about the image on the back because it was secondary. We're on a journey in the book of Acts together here at harvest time. And I want to tell you, I honestly believe that Acts chapter 2 is one of the most important chapters in the entire New Testament. It shows us what the outpouring of the Holy Spirit looks like. It shows us what the apostolic gospel looks like. And it shows us what the church is meant to look like. You know, these days... People have lots of different pictures of what the church should look like. High church, low church, traditional church, contemporary church, artsy church, hip church, unchurchy church. You know, there's actually a church in Arizona called the cool church. Do you like positive, encouraging church? Do you like passionate church? Do you like prophetic church, seeker-sensitive church, believer-centered church, missional church, emerging church, G12 church, meta church, mega church, house church, here a church, there a church, everywhere a church, church? <laughs> Who is right? I would submit to you that all of these different types of churches are like the picture on the back of the box. They're like the picture on the back of the puzzle. Different styles, different tastes, different contexts, different methods. These are all secondary in importance. But you know, the picture on the back is the picture that most people spend all of their time trying to figure out. The church of Acts chapter 2 is the picture on the front of the box. This is the picture of the church the way it should be. And this is the picture that will always cause unbelievers to choose the church. You know, it's up to each new generation of believers to keep looking at this picture and to keep fitting the pieces together uh, until their church looks just like this church. So this is our turn. It's up to us to rediscover this. It's up to us to recreate this, to return to this. And as I look at the picture on the front of the box in Acts chapter 2, I find three heart attitudes that we need to make our church like their church. Three 
heart attitudes that we need to make our church what it was meant to be. The first one is this, ongoing reverence. Ongoing reverence. The key word in this description of the early church is the word continue. Continue, continue, continue. It's clear enough in the English translation, but if you read this in Greek, it shouts at you. In Greek, this whole section of verses is written in a verbal tense that indicates continuing action. So this is what it really sounds like. They continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They continually devoted themselves to the fellowship. They continually devoted themselves to the breaking of the bread. They continually devoted themselves to the prayers. Everyone was continually filled with awe, and many miraculous signs and wonders were continually done through the apostles. All the believers were continually together, continually selling their real estate and their possessions. They continually distributed to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. Every day they broke bread house by house and ate together with glad and generous hearts. Every day the Lord added to the number of those who were continuing to be saved. You know, every time I've studied this passage, I've always focused on their activities. What did they do? And I, I really want to know because I would love for Harvest Time to grow by 3,000 newly converted souls in a single day. What were the building blocks of the early church? Worship and teaching and communion and fellowship and prayer and sacrificial giving. Certainly it's important to know what they did, but I want to tell you it's equally important to know how they did it. They continued. They kept on keeping on. You know that word in Acts 2.42, they continually devoted themselves, is a word we've already seen in the book of Acts. In Acts 1.14, it says they joined together constantly in prayer. It means obstinate persistence. It means to persevere. It means to prevail. You know, anybody can make a good start, but to endure is another matter altogether. It's important to know what they did at the start, but it's very important to know that they kept on doing it. It's also important to know the heart attitudes that were behind all of these activities. Luke points out several in these verses, and one of them is ongoing reverence. Everyone was continually filled with awe. Beloved, if you want to know what made the early church so great, it's that the fire of God had scared the hell out of every one of them. It's true. The fear of God was a major heart quality of the early church. Luke repeats that over and over again. Acts chapter 5. The story of Ananias and Sapphira, great Fear seized the church. He says it twice, once for Ananias and once for Sapphira. Acts 9.31, encouraged by the Holy Spirit, the church grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. Acts 19, verse 17, at Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. You see, what made the early church so great was that every member was actually born again. Every member had been cut to the heart by Peter's message about Jesus. Those words literally mean that they had been humbled in their hearts. They received Peter's confrontational message, you stink, you need Jesus. They believed on Jesus as Savior and Lord. Every member had repented of his sins. Every member had taken the radical step of water baptism. Every member had been filled with the Holy Spirit and touched by the fire of God. Every member was continuing to pursue spiritual growth. You know, I've read those words in Acts 2.47 so many times, but I, I never realized their meaning till now. The Lord added daily to the number of those who were being saved. 
Beloved, those who were being saved doesn't refer to the new converts. It refers to the whole community of believers. All of us are those who are being saved. Paul said the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Paul said to the Philippians, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That doesn't mean we work for our salvation. We could never do that. But it means we continue to work at our salvation. We keep on growing in God's grace. We keep on pursuing Christ's likeness. We keep on perfecting holiness in our lives out of reverence for Christ. I want to tell you this is a vitally important picture of the early church and it's up to us to recreate it. You know, the reason that the church today is not great is because too many people in the church have not yet had the hell scared out of them. Too many haven't been confronted by the apostolic gospel. You have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You need Jesus washing his forgiveness, his cleansing. Too many have never been cut to the heart. They've never experienced the godly sorrow that leads to repentance. Beloved, can I tell you that warm, fuzzy words make followers of men en masse. But only the truth and love, only the gospel makes genuine followers of Jesus. Too many people in the church have never taken the radical step of believers' baptism in water. They haven't made a break with their old life and renounced it. Too many have never experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit that gives that keen, ongoing awareness inside that the Shekinah consuming fire of God is with me. And too many others who have experienced those things haven't continued to aggressively pursue growth in their salvation. They haven't embraced the godly lifestyle and the spiritual discipline of those who are being saved. And because they've never done these things, they do not live in the fear of God and they do not fellowship in the body of Christ in the awe and the reverence of God. Acts chapter 2 shows us that the church is supernaturally birthed by the Holy Spirit. Beloved, look at me and may God give you grace. The church is unlike any other organization on earth. The church is unlike any other club. It's unlike any other group. It's like any other social community. The church of Jesus Christ is like any other religious community on earth. Listen, you're about to hear the best definition you've ever heard of what the church is. The church is individuals born again by the Holy Spirit who have been birthed by the Holy Spirit into an entirely new and unique community. I'll say it again. The church is individuals that have been born again personally, and they have been birthed by the Holy Spirit into a new and a unique community. The word to describe the fellowship in Acts 2.42 is the word koinonia. It appears here for the very first time in the Bible. It continues to appear throughout the entire New Testament, but it couldn't appear before Acts chapter 2. The Koinonia community of the church was not possible before the day of Pentecost. It was not possible until the Holy Spirit was poured out. And when the Holy Spirit was poured out, the first thing he did was he baptized individuals with fire. And then the second thing he did was he gave birth to this new Koinonia community. Beloved, the fellowship, the church, is the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul calls it the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Listen to me. Unity in the body of Christ is the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. Paul said in Ephesians, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Listen, make every effort to preserve the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Beloved, listen to me and may God give you grace. 
if you lift your voice up against the fellowship, if you jeopardize the unity of the body, you are lifting your voice up against the Holy Spirit himself. That's why when Ananias and Sapphira lied about their gift to the church, Peter said to them, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you would lie to the Holy Spirit? To sin against the community of believers is to sin against the Holy Spirit who gave birth to the church, who abides in the church, and who sustains the unity of the church. That ought to scare the hell out of you. That's why Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, the reason that many of you are weak and sick and some have even died is because you have sinned against Christ's body, his church. Beloved, can I tell you, sometimes the Holy Spirit moves away from churches because if he didn't, he would only have one alternative. God said to Moses, Moses, I'm sending you away. I'm sending you on in the company of an angel, but I'm not going with you because these people are stubborn. And God said, if I stay with you, I'll kill you myself. Beloved, look at me and God give you grace. The church is the Holy Spirit's baby. Don't hurt the baby. The church is the Holy Spirit's pride and joy. The church is the Holy Spirit's charge. She has been promised in marriage to Jesus Christ and it's the Holy Spirit's job to protect her and to prepare her for the wedding day. Don't mess with the bride. The church is the Holy Spirit's building. It's the Holy Spirit's temple. Don't tear it down. What made the early church so great? It was ongoing reverence. They lived in the fear of the Lord. And because they did, they walked very softly so as not to disrupt the work of the Holy Spirit in the church and so to grieve Him. You know, on Mother's Day, I experienced physically a manifestation of the weight of the glory of God that I have only experienced one other time in my life. When I was nine years old, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit alone one night in my bed. I remember, I didn't even know what the baptism of the Holy Spirit was. My mother had to explain it to me the next day, but I remember I was lying in bed and I just began to worship the Lord. And I began to say, thank you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. And as I just began to worship, the living presence of God came into my bedroom and the weight of the glory of God started pushing down heavy on me. You know, as a little kid, I was very afraid. I was very afraid of the dark. I was always afraid at night. I, I was terrified. I want to tell you, when the presence of God came into my room, I wasn't afraid anymore. It was so beautiful. It was so powerful. It was awesome. I, I changed all of a sudden from saying, thank you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. I began worshiping in a new language I had never known before. And I remember lying there distinctly, and I didn't want to move a muscle because I was afraid if I moved, that beautiful presence would go away, and I didn't want it to go away. Beloved, that's the ongoing reverence that is meant to be in the church. We need to speak very carefully so as not to push the Holy Spirit away. I want to tell you that Harvest Time Church is a community of believers that was birthed by the Holy Spirit in 1983. Harvest Time Church was not the idea of a man. It was not the idea of a church planting committee. It was not the idea of a district superintendent. Harvest Time Church was God's idea. Do you know, going back to the 1940s, there was a group of Pentecostals that met together in house prayer meetings praying that a spirit-filled church would be planted here in this town. They prayed for decades. Some of their grandchildren and great-grandchildren are in our church today. In the 1970s, Assemblies of God people began writing to the district office in Sturbridge, Massachusetts, asking the district superintendent if they would plant an Assemblies of God church here. And he kept writing back to them, no, 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 I have the letters in a file in my office. 
1983, God called a 28-year-old youth pastor to come plant Harvest Time Church. He met absolutely none of the criteria that was set forth by our district for church planting. He wasn't old enough. He wasn't experienced enough. He didn't have the education that they were looking for. He met absolutely zero of the requirements. But how many of you know when God opens a door, no man can shut it? We had a district superintendent who knew how to hear from the Holy Spirit. And God said, yes. The Holy Spirit gave birth to our church. He's been with us all these years and he's still with us now and he is the unifying presence among us. Beloved, Harvest Time Church is his baby. So let's be very, very careful. Don't hurt the baby. Let's walk very softly so as not to disrupt the unity of the Holy Spirit among us and so to grieve him. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and don't take the Holy Spirit from us. Three heart attitudes to make our church what it's meant to be. First of all, ongoing reverence. Secondly, ongoing devotion. Can I tell you, anyone can put on a good show starting out, but to endure is another matter entirely. Hidalgo is a movie based on the life of Frank Hopkins, one of the performers in Wild Bill Cody's Wild Wild West show. In 1891, Frank Hopkins entered and won a horse race across the Arabian desert. No one in Arabia had ever seen an American Mustang horse before, and when Frank Hopkins showed up with his Mustang, everybody laughed, and no one believed that he could win the race. And I love the opening scene in the movie when the race begins. They fire the pistol, and all of the other horses and riders take off at breakneck speed, and Frank Hopkins and Hidalgo just lope out of town. Everybody's jeering and mocking, laughing at them. And he leans forward into the horse's ear and he says, it's okay, it's all just for show. And sure enough, as soon as all the riders were over the first rise and out of the sight of all of the onlookers and spectators, everybody slowed down to a walk. Do you know, so much of life is like that. New things always start with a lot of excitement, but after the rush is over, slow and steady wins the race. And the Christian life is like that too. God isn't really interested in whether you start with a great show of enthusiasm. Remember, Jesus talked about a little seed that sprouted up with a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of joy, but when the heat of the day fell upon it, it couldn't endure the heat. God isn't interested in your show of enthusiasm. God really wants to know whether you can continue. He who endures to the end shall be saved. Paul said, everyone competes in a race but only one gets the gold, so be in it to win it. I want to tell you something. I'm serious as a heart attack. I'm in it to win it. <laughs> what will make our church like their church in Acts chapter 2? Ongoing devotion to four things. Ongoing devotion to four things. First this, stay hungry for your pastor's teaching and preaching. Stay hungry for your pastor's teaching and preaching. Did you see the sign up there? It says they continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Beloved, people who are freshly full of the Holy Spirit crave the Word of God. They read the Word, they memorize the Word, and they pursue interactive teaching in the Word. I want you to notice it does not say that they continually devoted themselves to the teaching of Joel. It doesn't say that they continually devoted themselves to Joseph or Joyce or Jensen or John. It says they were devoted to their pastor's teaching. You know, I love to listen to good preaching and teaching on television. I, I have MP3s of preaching. I have CDs of preaching. Uh, I like to listen to it, but I want to tell you, nothing promotes spiritual growth like live Bible teaching. Amen. See, it, it's interactive. 
there's discussion, there's questions and answers, there's an opportunity to apply it directly to your life. Nothing helps you grow like pastoral instruction and sometimes correction and exhortation. Nothing helps you grow like receiving, teaching, and preaching in a live environment where there's a prophetic anointing on your pastor to speak directly into your life and over your life. You see, because I'm your pastor, there's an anointing on me to speak to you on behalf of God. We've been having such a great time in our discipleship classes this fall. I want to tell you, I've fallen in love with my Cleansing Stream class. I, they're just like my friends. We've had such a great time on this road trip. We got in after 1 o'clock last night. I'm liable to say anything. I actually dropped the microphone in the 8.30 service, so anything could happen. But I want to tell you that, that, that I've enjoyed my time. We, we took 21 out to Pittsburgh, and it was such precious fellowship. Pastor Nick has been teaching Bible study on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and he's had people staying behind till after 10 every night, just asking questions and applying the Word of God to their lives. He taught a Bible study on Daniel's vision of the 70 weeks two weeks ago. I'm telling you, you ought to do yourself a favor and go to our website and listen to that. Pastor Faith has been having an amazing time in Pathways to Recovery. Altogether, we have between four and 500 people participating in our midweek discipleship classes. That's about half the church, and I want to tell you that's awesome. But I want to know, would you join us? Would you join us for Alpha or for Cleansing Stream? If you've already taken those classes, would you join us for Pathways to Recovery? Join us for Jesus the Messiah, the Bible study, for the Alpha Marriage Course. Join Ephraim and Alma for the Names of God on Sunday mornings in the Dome at 10 o'clock. If you're over 60, join Young at Heart. If you're under 30, join Collision. If you're a teen student, join The Current. We have a new ministry we're just getting ready to launch in about two weeks for college-age students. If you have children, bring them for Royal Rangers and Missionettes. Why do we prioritize making our kids well-rounded citizens of the world. The world and its passions are passing away. Let's prioritize making our children fit citizens of heaven. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another, Paul said. What will make our church, like the church of the book of Acts, ongoing devotion to four things. Secondly, this, marry your local church family. Marry your local church family. They continually devoted themselves to the fellowship. They were devoted to their group. They were devoted to their community of believers, their local body. That word fellowship is the word koinonia. It means to share something in common. What they shared in common was Jesus Christ. Their love for him. Their devotion to him. Their experience in him. Beloved, listen, and may God give you grace. Sharing Jesus in common trumps anything that you might have in common with anyone else. You know, very interestingly, the word koinonia is used to describe the bond between a husband and a wife. And it's so appropriate because it is the Holy Spirit that causes the one flesh bond between a man and a woman. I say this with all respect and I say it with compassion, but I want to tell you, gay marriage can never be a marriage. Because, because a man and a woman, when they are united together in marriage, the Holy Spirit comes and creates out of them a new entity called one flesh. And Paul said that's a picture of Christ and his church. The Holy Spirit has come and created this marriage bond between us. The early believers married themselves to their local church. All the believers were together. Doesn't mean that they all lived together. It means they did life together. It means they set aside what they had in common with other people in society in favor of what they had in common with each other. They spent the days and the months and the years of their lives together. They hung out together. They ate dinner together. They observed holidays together. They celebrated life's milestones together. They overcame setbacks and losses and hardships together. 
Beloved, I have a very, very important question to ask you this morning. I want to know, will you marry me? We spent the church building fund on this ring. It's fake. It cost $1.75. That's all we had in there. See, I really want to do life with you. Would you marry Harvest Time Church? Would you make a permanent commitment to this body of believers? Would you devote your life to the people here with whom you have Christ in common? Would you let that commonality in Christ trump whatever you might have in common with other people in society? Would you attend and give and serve and support? Would you pray and would you build with us? Some time ago, a man and his family started worshiping with us. They came from another church, and we met them at one of our welcome coffees. And when he introduced himself, he said this. He said, we, we go to such and such a church, but he said, we are having a love affair with this church. And when he, he said that, you know, something, something didn't hit me quite right with it. They left that other church, and they worshiped here for a while, but, you know, like all affairs, didn't last long. And it ended messy. Compare that with what I hear time and again at our membership classes. Every membership class I do, inevitably, I have someone who comes to me and says, Pastor, I just want you to know, we moved here, and when we came here, we knew we were immediately home. They said, we never even looked anywhere else. We never visited anywhere else. We knew that this was the place for us. You know, that's not everyone's experience, but I love it when that happens. If you've been having an affair... It's time to quit it, and it's time to make a marriage commitment. Maybe you've been here at Harvest Time Church for a very long time. This would be a good time to renew your vows. This would be a good time to, to reaffirm your commitment to our church. Grow old along with me. The best is yet to be. What will make our church like their church? Ongoing devotion to four things. Third, experience the unifying power of communion. Experience the unifying power of communion. It says they continually devoted themselves to the breaking of the bread. Luke means that they constantly celebrated communion, probably as part of every fellowship meal that they shared together. You know, I have to confess to you, as I studied these verses, the Holy Spirit pinned my ears back a bit. He said, Glenn, you haven't been presenting communion in the right way to the congregation. Some churches have an understanding of communion that's very ritualistic. They believe that Christ is present in the bread and in the cup and through the act of partaking the bread and the cup that they are receiving Christ. We don't believe that. But the Holy Spirit reminded me that I have presented communion to you as something very individualistic. I've always focused on the personal forgiveness of sins. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's true, he, he does. But I want to tell you, communion is something much bigger than a celebration of personal forgiveness. Communion is the celebration of God's presence abiding in our community. Jesus is present, not in the bread and in the cup, but he is present in our gathering. When two or three or four or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. This is, you're, gonna, you're never going to hear better preaching on communion than this right here. This is good. This is a revelation from the Holy Spirit. It's good. I, I, forgive me. It's not nice to compliment your own cooking, but it came from the Holy Spirit. It's so good. I, I can't help myself. <laughs> Beloved, listen. Communion is a celebration of our togetherness in Jesus Christ. It, it's our ce celebration of our connectedness to one another through him. Communion. Community. Paul said the cup of thanksgiving that we bless, it's participation in his blood. The bread that we break, it's participation in his body. Listen, and because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body because we all partake of the one loaf, Jesus Christ. 
Communion is a celebration of our unity. That's why Paul said, God is deadly serious that we not approach this table if we're in disunity with his body. And if my relationship with the body isn't right, the answer is not to skip communion. The answer is to humble my heart to God and to come back into alignment with his body. In the spiritual, listen, this is good right here. This is good preaching. In the spiritual act of communion, the presence of Jesus releases supernatural unifying power among us. It's a miraculous kind of unity that doesn't exist in any other group or any other club or any other organization. In communion, God refreshes something in my heart and my spirit. I belong to him and I belong to you. We belong to one another. We belong to him. That's why it's written in our constitution. If you absent yourself from communion three months in a row, you are no longer considered an active member of this body. Do you know, it occurred to me, I never thought about it before, but I have never known another Christian group with a sense of belonging like the Roman Catholic Church. I have never met another, another group where there is such a sense of belonging to the church. And it occurred to me that perhaps it has something to do with the fact that they celebrate communion every time they worship. In fact, they celebrate communion seven days a week. In fact, 24 hours a day around the world, they are always celebrating communion. And maybe that has something to do with the sense of belonging that is so strong with them. The evangelical has had an epiphany. <laughs> In just a few minutes, we're going to celebrate communion together. And we're not going to celebrate individual forgiveness only. We're going to celebrate our togetherness. We're going to celebrate our connection to one another because of Jesus. And listen, when we do, the living presence of Jesus is going to release a supernatural unifying power in our midst. You're about to feel part of the body of Christ. You're about to feel connected or reconnected with this body. We're about to experience the unifying power of communion. What will make our church like their church? Ongoing devotion to four things. Finally this, grow on in corporate prayer and worship. Grow on in corporate prayer and worship. They continually devoted themselves to the prayers. Did you notice the use of article of the article the the apostles teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of the bread and the prayers. Luke is indicating that they attended the set times of Jewish prayer and worship in the temple. And they used the set prayers of the Jewish people. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, who bringeth forth bread from the earth. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I want you to notice with me that they started out using the old forms of prayer and worship but they were invested with new life and new joy and new meaning because of Jesus. I remember the early days of the charismatic renewal back in the 1970s. We had a prayer and praise service every Friday night and there were people from every denomination freshly born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. Our pastor was a spirit-filled Baptist and they say there's no miracles. We had Catholic charismatics, we had priests and nuns, spirit-filled Episcopalians and Lutherans and Methodists. We ourselves were spirit-filled Presbyterians. And we started out using the old familiar forms, but they were filled with new life and new meaning. The Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, the Doxology, the Mystery of Faith, the Act of Contrition, Communion. You know, the, the first Catholic service I ever attended, I was in college, Bible college already, and I want to tell you, I was so blown away by the beauty of the liturgy, I wanted to just stand up and shout. It was so gorgeous because Jesus inside of me made those words ring with truth and life. But I want you to notice with me, as the early church grew, the old forms gave way to new things. 
The New Testament is full of new confessions, of new creeds, of new hymns, of new doxologies, of new prayers formulated by the church. We found the same thing with the charismatic movement in the 1970s. As we grew in Christ, old forms gave way to new things. And we found the same thing here at Harvest Time. We're constantly growing and evolving in the Spirit. You know, we're not the same as we were in 1983 when the church started. We're not the same as we were in 1996 when Denise and I came here. We're not the same as we were when we moved into this building in 2004. And if Jesus tarries, we won't stay the same as we are today. We're not what we used to be, but we're not yet what we're going to be either. We're growing on from faith to faith, from strength to strength, and from glory to glory. Beloved, it has not yet appeared what we shall be, but we shall become like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Won't you grow on with us? Three heart attitudes that make our church what it's meant to be. Ongoing reverence. Ongoing devotion and finally ongoing, you have to wait till next week to find out. <laughs> next week I'll tell you what this cheesesteak sandwich has to do with Pastor Kevin and what it has to do with our heart attitude. I want to ask the worship team to come and I want to take a moment, I want to tell you about next Sunday. Next Sunday we're having a ministry fair over in the Dome. So we will start at 11.30, I promise you, next week. Thank you for being patient. We will start on time next week. And I'm going to briefly share with you the third point. And by briefly, I mean pray for me. <laughs> and then I'm going to invite you to go over to the dome with me. And we're going to give you an opportunity to see all of the various ministries here at our church. And give you an opportunity to sign up and to serve. And after I preach the third point, you're all going to sign up and you're going to serve. Uh, I want to say this, you know, um, uh, with the number of services that we do, uh, it's very busy on Saturday nights and Sundays, and we have a little bit of a revolving door, and we, we don't always have the time for connectivity that I wish we had. We'll get that when we build phase two. But if you want to get connected to the body, the way to do it is to serve. The way to do it is to sign up, use your gifts. That's where you'll make friends. That's where you'll really become a part of the body of Jesus Christ. And so next week, we're going to give you that opportunity. We have a brand new church database. Uh, we want to put your photo in the database along with your information. We took about 400 photos at the church picnic and gave away an iPad, but there's still at least another five or 600 of you that we need to get. So next Sunday, we want to take your uh, photo. We're going to be having a drawing for another wonderful, beautiful, brand new iPad. And so um, if you get your photo taken, you'll get entered in uh, for the iPad drawing. And we hope that you'll come and be with us. I want you to stand on your feet if you would. We're going to share communion in just a moment. But before we do, I want you to look at the picture at the front of the box. And I want you to imagine what our church could be like. Imagine what our church could be like if we fellowship together in ongoing reverence. If we were always careful not to grieve the Holy Spirit by disrupting his work of unity among us. Imagine what our church could be like if we all continually devoted ourselves to letting the word of Christ dwell richly in us. Imagine what our church could look like if we devoted ourselves in marriage to one another. No more affairs. Let's get married. Imagine what our church could look like if we experience the unifying power of communion and we grow on together in prayer and worship. I want to tell you, beloved, if we would do those things we would become the irresistible, highly favored, awe-inspiring, anointed church of the book of Acts. Let's make our church look like this church. Come on, would you sing with me? Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Come on, let's worship him. You step down. Oh, here I am to worship. 
lift up your face to heaven. Lift up your hands to heaven and let's just love on Jesus right now. Come on, just love him right now. We love you, we love you, we love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come any way you want to. Come, Holy Spirit. Come breathe life among us. Come, Holy Spirit, refresh and restore, repair and renew. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Would you bow your heads with me for just one moment? Just before we share communion together, I have to ask this question. The church is individuals who have been born again by the Holy Spirit, birthed by the Holy Spirit into a new and unique community. Before you can belong to the community of the church, you have to belong to Jesus personally. You have to receive the message about your own spiritual need. You have to believe on Jesus as Lord and Savior. You can't be part of the church until you're part of Him. I wonder before we come to this table together, I wonder if there's someone here and you have not entered through the narrow door of salvation. Jesus said, I'm the gate, I'm the door. Make every effort to enter through the narrow door. It's the impossible miracle of salvation, like a camel passing through the eye of a needle. I wonder if you're here, maybe you've heard the message many times, maybe you've prayed the prayer before, but something is in your heart, you know, I need to give my life to Jesus. I, I need to receive his forgiveness, his cleansing. I need to make a break with my old way of life. Start a new life in Christ. While your heads are bowed all over this place, if you're here and you need to pray that prayer today, I want to lead you in it. And I want you to just raise your hand wherever you are. You can't be part of the church. You can't belong to the church till you belong to Jesus. Come on, is there someone here? Come on, is there someone here? I want to give my heart to Jesus today. I want to become born again today. Come on. If that's you, I want to lead you in a prayer. I want you to lift your hand high so I can see it. I want to lead you in a prayer. Is there someone here? I want to give my heart to Jesus. I want to ask Jesus. I want to become born again. Come on, while heads are bowed, is there someone here? I want to lead you in that prayer. Come on, there's someone. Is there someone else? There's one. Is there another? Come on. There has to be another. They always come by twos. Come on, who else? Today is my day. I need to ask Jesus. There's a second. There's someone else. Come on, who else? I need to ask Jesus into my heart. Come on, there's somebody else. Come on, who else? I need to ask Jesus into my heart. Today is the day. Today is the day. Let's all lift up our hands all over this place. We're going to be like four friends. And we're going to help carry some people to Jesus for his healing today. Come on, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I want you to follow after me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving me. Father, thank you for sending your only son. Jesus, thank you for coming. You lived for me. You died on the cross for me. Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. I believe you rose from the dead. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Jesus, I need your forgiveness. Forgive my sins. Wash me. Cleanse me. Make me new. I'm making a break with my old life. And I'm starting a new life. I accept you now as my Lord and the leader of my life. In Jesus' name. Oh, come on, give him a big praise in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Listen, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time when this service is over, come to the altar. I'd love to meet you. We have something we want to give you, and we just want to pray and celebrate that decision with you. Now, just before we share communion, the church is the Holy Spirit's baby. This church is the Holy Spirit's baby. Don't hurt the baby. 
just before we celebrate our togetherness at the Lord's table. Perhaps somebody here has been out of alignment with the body of Christ. Let's come back into alignment with one another today. Luke doesn't hide the weaknesses of the church in Acts, but he shows what can happen when people band together in their love for Jesus Christ. Would you trust God with the things that you don't understand? Would you trust the leadership that God has set in place in this church, me and the other pastors and the board of deacons and trustees? Would you let Jesus come and be our peace and tear down any walls that have arisen between us? We just returned from Cleansing Stream last night and in keeping with the spiritual strategies that we've learned in Cleansing Stream, uh, I want to lead you in a prayer today. I want to pray first a, a prayer of repentance on my own behalf, and then I want to lead you, and I'm asking you to voluntarily participate. You know, in Cleansing Stream, when we go through the retreat, they ask everyone as they deal with different topics, they say, you know, even if you don't think it applies to you, just participate and ask the Holy Spirit that if there's anything there that you're not even aware of, to just reveal it and just to remove it from your life. So I'm going to pray a prayer, and then I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And it's completely up to you, but I would love for you to participate. And let's see if there's anything that we need the Holy Spirit to just move out of the way. Let me pray first. Father God, as the earthly head of this congregation, I ask you to forgive me for failing to teach the full meaning of communion. Father, forgive me for neglecting to lead your people to experience the unifying power of communion. Now would you follow me in this prayer? Father God, I ask you to forgive me for receiving communion while out of alignment with your body. Father, forgive me for participation in gossip. Forgive me for participation in slander. Forgive me for participation with offense. Father, forgive me for ignoring order set forth by Jesus. Forgive me for inciting, promoting, or perpetuating anger. Father, I repent for disrupting the unity of the body and for grieving the Holy Spirit. Listen, I want to pause here. I know hurtful things happen in church. You know, as a pastor, sometimes I hurt people and I send them away hurt. And I want to tell you, it, it breaks my heart when it happens. I know some of you have come from other churches where you've experienced hurtful situations, hurtful things. Can I tell you, even if you've come to a new congregation, this one, or if you're just passing through, can I tell you, you cannot move forward in your walk with Christ till you let go of those things. Let go. Give it over to Jesus. I'm going to finish this prayer. And, and I just felt in my heart, even if the things we're praying about pertain to a, another experience that happened somewhere else, I want you to just let it go now in Jesus' name. Let's pray on. In the name of Jesus, I renounce participation with offense. I renounce participation with gossip. I renounce participation with rebellion. I renounce participation with rabble rousing. Offense, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Gossip, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Rebellion, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Strife, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And I break your power off of my life and off of our congregation in Jesus' name. Come on, let's give the Lord a big hand of praise in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Those that are waiting on us, 
Would you come to serve communion now? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, we invite you to share with us at this table. We're going to ask you to come down the center aisle, receive your communion emblems. If you'd return to your seats using the side aisles, when everyone has been served, we're going to receive together. And beloved, listen, when we receive this commu communion, the Holy Spirit is going to release a supernatural unifying power in this room. Get ready to experience the unifying power of communion. Pastor Nick's going to lead us in worship while you come. God bless you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Jesus, come and be our peace. Tear down every wall of hurt, hostility, and anger. In Jesus' name, let the God of all comfort manifest his presence. 
The Apostle Paul wrote to the believers at Corinth, I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that your body was broken so that we could be made whole. Thank you that your body was broken so that we could be made one. We celebrate our togetherness in you. We celebrate our connectedness in you. Jesus, as we partake of this bread today, release unity through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's receive the bread together. Thank you, O oh Lord. Thank you, O oh Lord. Thank you, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Come on, give him thanks, church. We thank you, O oh Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Paul continues, in the same way after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you now for your blood that cleanses us from every sin. Thank you for washing us now. Jesus, as we partake of this cup today, let the commonality that we share in you trump whatever we have in, com in common with society. Father, make us one, even as you and the Son are one. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's receive the cup together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's praise him. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. We thank you, O oh Lord. We thank you, O oh Lord. We thank you, O oh Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Whew. Wow. His presence is here with us. I want you to look at your neighbor. You're going to find they're, they all of a sudden got better looking, just real, just that fast. Our ushers are coming, and they're going to pass a container down your row. You can put your empty communion cup in it. Now, 